the title of my sermon is The King of Glory is Here. Amen. He is in our midst, He is in our lives, and He is operating and functioning in every sphere of our lives. And I pray that as we embark on digging into the scriptures this afternoon, that we lay hold of some of the reminders that we can find in Psalm 24 in totality, which we'll read in a moment, and that ultimately we will capture David's heart. We will lay hold of the standard that David highlights and presents to us this afternoon. Do you know that your perspective on the greatness and the goodness and the glory of God emerges directly as a result of your heart attitude towards Him? And so it should give us a moment to think about how we think about the King of glory in our own lives. Do we take him at his word? Or is it caveated with some of the challenges and the trials and the times and the seasons that we find ourselves in? Because fresh seasons require fresh perspective. And with fresh perspective comes fresh opportunities. And with those opportunities comes divine breakthroughs. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 24. It's widely acknowledged and accepted that David wrote this psalm. He wrote Psalm 22, 23, which everybody knows very, very well, and 24. I'm reading the ESV translation. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the world and those who dwell herein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him who seek the face of God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is This King of glory, the Lord of hosts, He is the King of glory. Wow, there are some promises and truths to lay hold of right there that David declares so eloquently, but also so explicitly. It's widely accepted that this was written upon the occasion on the entrance of the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem during the reign of David. And what we see here is this psalm is broken down into three distinct areas. Number one, it highlights that he is creator, which we will unpack in a moment. Number two, it highlights that he is holy. And number three, it affirms to us that he is sovereign. And so let's explore these areas one by one this afternoon. So verses one and two, David essentially starts this psalm by reminding us of the sheer magnitude of God's goodness, of God's greatness, and God's glory in our lives. And can I interject right here and say in the season that we are living in, where everything is being shaken, that is a fantastic reminder for us as Christians to remember that our God is the creator of heaven and earth, that he is sovereign, that he is Lord. In the season that we find ourselves in, what greater truth to start with today than that fact and that reality? You saw, I'm sure, on the news recently, um, the um, Amazon CEO, Jeff Bezos, the billionaire, um, Richard Branson as well, they were in a fight on who could get to the edge of space first. And they spent like billions of pounds. And it made me think as I was reading these verses, as I was preparing this message, that man, we have absolutely absolutely no idea of the sheer magnitude 
of the glory and the greatness of our Creator. They spent billions of pounds to barely get to the edge of space, which if you're wondering, I did some research on this, scientists argue it's somewhere between 62 and 66 miles above the Earth's sea level. Jeff Bezos went to 65 miles. He barely scratched the surface of space. And yet our God flung stars into space. He is sovereign, he is Lord, he rules, and he reigns. And I think we need to take a moment in our own lives to try and quantify something that is ultimately unquantifiable. And yet, guess what? He knows you by name. Wow, hello. He knows you by name. He knows the number of hairs on your head. And yet man has absolutely no idea of the enormity of our God. They are still trying to work him out. Ha, no chance. That gives us a tiny snapshot of all that God created. The scale, the scope of God's creation cannot be adequately appraised or quantified. It just needs to be marveled at, celebrated, and accepted. The word declares here, and the world and those who dwell within. Which brings me to my next point. We belong to God. Wow, if there is nothing else as a reminder in our lives today, lay hold of that promise, that we belong to God, that he is intricately and intimately interested in every single part and area of our lives. Nothing takes him by surprise. And we read the promises of God here. Every person that has ever lived, every person that currently lives on this earth belongs to God, made in his image and in his likeness, which is a reminder for us as believers that a simple byproduct of having the privilege of belonging to God is that we are ultimately accountable to him because he is relentlessly and continually pouring out his goodness, pouring out his greatness and his glory to humanity. And he has invited you and I as sons and daughters of the most high God to be partakers in that goodness. Take a moment to reflect on that in your own lives. Where does your joy ultimately reside? When you wake up in the morning, what is the first thought on your heart? Do you marvel like I do? Maybe you haven't been able to travel on an aeroplane, but it's something I like to do. And I have a problem with this because I like the aisle seat on the plane, but I like to look out of the window when you get to 40,000 feet. And so invariably you're leaning across a stranger and I just see the clouds. And I'm like, the entire city that I was just in is a speck, 40,000 feet up in the air. And yet there is more. And then I marvel at the fact that he knows me. Wow. By name, each and every day, he sees my going in and my coming out. He teaches me to number my days. Wow, that is a God that is not just a creator, but he created us for that relationship. Amen? And so the magnitude of this should not be lost on us, but more importantly than that, the responsibility that we have to steward the goodness and greatness of God is not an invitation that we can ignore or relegate to the margins of our Christian life. It demands a response from you and I each and every day, a response birthed in awareness of the responsibility attached to being a son and a daughter of the Most High God. You know, we cannot be frivolous or wasteful with God's provision in our lives. With everything that he has poured into our lives, our finances, our time, our gifts, our talents, the divine opportunities that we get to enjoy each and every day, we will give an account to him. That should impact and influence the way that we choose to live our lives today. We must protect and sustain all that he has given us. And that opens up divine opportunities for those blessings to then flow into our lives. Second point, he is holy. This is where we're gonna spend a fair chunk of our time this afternoon. And when I think about approaching the heavenly throne, I know that I need to come as I am. The best person I can be is me. Not a imitation, a pale imitation of somebody else. Not trying to do or be something or someone that I'm not because he knows who I am and who I am in Christ, that's the real me. 
And but when I think about approaching that heavenly throne, the word declares that we can go right up to him to accept the mercy, receive the help, as the word declares in Hebrews. And I know that I need to come as I am, but I also believe that there is a momentary standard that he expects of us. So I want you to think about in your own life, at the forefront of your life, when you approach that heavenly throne, what's in the content of your heart? What's the narrative? Is it the shopping list that God needs to provide for this week? Is it the list of demands that we want to impose on him? Do we come thankful? Do we come boldly? How do you, in your life, approach the heavenly throne? Because David gives us some very clear examples here, that we must be pure, we must be clean, because it's that that pleases God. Do you know that it's not taxing, it's not erroneous, it's not inconvenient to live a life that honors and glorifies God. It is an honor and a privilege to uphold the godly standard that he has set in his word. Can I get a strong amen in the house? Amen. amen. And the best way to achieve that is to allow your heart to be filled with adoration, majesty, awe about the love and the goodness of God, but also an opportunity to allow humbleness to, to, that will transcend all flesh, all worldly thinking. And you might think here, verses three through six, that David presents an unachievable standard. Wrong. We can achieve this standard. He gives us four attributes that I want to take a moment to unpack for us in our lives. Number one, clean hands. Better put, we must have a healthy, Christ-centered, value-added, life-giving conduct in our lives. Said it another way, how you behave publicly, and I'm not talking about here and now in the church building where we all put on our Sunday best. I'm talking at 8.45 tomorrow morning when it's pouring with rain and you forgot your umbrella as you're walking to the subway station and you can't get a seat on the tube and you're grumbling because the queue in Starbucks was too long. I'm talking about that conduct. A pure heart. Wow, it's already getting difficult, right? He could already start to feel that this is insurmountable. You know, you could spend the rest of the calendar year just focusing on the first attribute that David gives us. And he's barely finished that. And he's straight in in the same sentence. A pure heart. Your outward appearance, your behavior, that alone is horribly insufficient. The risk of deploying self-effort there will be brutally exposed if you do not possess a clean heart to complement your good behavior. And yet the Bible says, the heart is desperately deceitful and wicked above all else. Who can know it? And so you're already sitting there qualifying what I'm saying in your mind. No, 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 Pastor Scott, this is unachievable. No, David makes it clear, this is achievable. So we need to move beyond excuses and explanations and actually lay hold of what God is calling us to be. Character. This is what this element comes down to, character, not your reputation. Your reputation is people's perception of you that may or may not be accurate. Your character is who you truly are, how you behave towards someone who can do absolutely nothing for you, how you behave when nobody's looking, the content and the condition of your heart. How is it postured to those who don't yet know Jesus, to your enemies? to your boss at work, to people that you know don't like you. That's character. Does your character continually convey godly desires and aspirations? Does it reflect the heart of Jesus to humanity? Hmm, it's getting tricky. The third element, no worship of idols. There can be no idols in our lives as believers, friends. Our God is a jealous God. If you think for one moment that there can be anything or anyone in your life between you and your relationship with God, they may or it may be able to exist for a moment. But God will dismantle, destroy, diminish, and completely depart that from your life because it is Him and Him alone. And can I give you some advice? 
It's much better if you do it yourself. It's less painful. <laughs> but it gives us an opportunity to think. In Matthew 6, talks about treasure, potentially, uh, finance, sorry, potentially being an idol. Whatever your treasure is, whatever your idol is, your heart is also there. And our heart has to be for God and God alone. Nothing else can take God's place in our lives. And that is a decision that we have to make in our heart, not in our head. As I said, Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart is also. It is also worth acknowledging that each of these attributes that David is describing builds on the previous attribute. So nobody can see the condition of anyone's heart necessarily. You can't see somebody's heart physically, but you can get a pretty good gauge about what's in somebody's heart by what comes out. Out of the overflow of the heart, what happens? The mouth speaks. So whenever I speak to people, I'm fascinated by what is said, but I'm also paying attention to what isn't being mentioned. So what do you talk about? If there was a possibility this afternoon for a pie chart to be thrown up on the screen and segmented percentages of everything that you have spoken about in the last seven days, what would be on that screen? No, 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 no condemnation, right? But conviction, a moment to allow heart excavation and an examination in our own hearts and lives about what and who is truly important. Because this is what David is making very clear here. This is not an optional list. These are not ideas that he's presenting for our, our, our reflections or thoughts. He's giving us very, very clear standards to uphold. We must become honest, integral expressions of God's love to absolutely every person that we interact and encounter. We do not get to dictate and determine, well, I'll show the love of God to this person, but not that person. No, it occurs to everyone all the time. Deception, lies, control, and manipulation has no place in the heart of a believer or even in the body of Christ. Force is an awkward question for us. Are we victims or perpetrators of those aforementioned words? Because those things can manifest in our hearts and lives so quickly and so often, and the challenge more often than not is that we don't recognize it until weeks or months down the line. When you think about being deceived, the price is invariably being paid for that deception before you even recognize that you have been deceived. Which leads me to a really awkward question. Who can stand at this point? David's made it clear. He's outlined four areas. Clean hands, pure heart, no worship of idols, no deceitfulness, no bad language, no swearing, etc. So at this point, who, who can stand? I can't. Sobering truth is that none of us can. But that's what reminds me about the glory and the goodness of all that Jesus achieved on the cross. He and he alone blots out our sins. He removes our negative thoughts, our poor attitudes, our unhealthy aspirations, our unclean minds. We are molded and shaped and refined by his grace. We become pure and clean because of what Jesus did on the cross. That's what makes it possible. Amen. Which means that as we are cleansed, as we are renewed, we have the possibility and the potential to live in a manner that honors his holy name. Which means our Christian lives have to be compatible and consistent with our holy God. It is not inconvenient to live a life of holiness to God. So I'm challenging you, I'm intentionally provoking you to the same degree that I've had to challenge myself when preparing for this message. Challenge yourself in this area, friends. Being challenged in a healthy manner for Christ-centered outcomes will always prevent us from becoming complacent. The challenge with becoming complacent is that we settle for mediocrity. 
We settle for the status quo, the lowest possible effort and commitment on our part. And yet God calls us to a high standard. And that's going to be costly. That's going to require investment. That's going to require sacrifice. That's going to require us to be molded and shaped and refined by God. That's going to require the conviction and obedience of what the Holy Spirit leads us to and shows us in our own lives. And often the challenge attached to that is it's inconvenient. We find it uncomfortable. I'm a Christian to a certain point. And then when it becomes a little bit too costly, a little bit too sacrificial, we mentally check out. And that's not what God has for us. You know why? David gives us the promise. Verse 5, you will receive blessing from the Lord. Amen. Anyone up for a bit of blessing from God? There's a promise here. It's ironclad, which means that we need to position ourselves, friends. We cannot have narrow road blessings with a wide road mentality in our lives. We need to reflect and ruminate in what's going on in our hearts, the attitude and aptitude that we can adopt in certain scenarios, the default patterns of thinking that block and diminish God's blessing over our lives. God wants to move. God wants to pour out blessing in your life. And there's a promise here that it doesn't declare that you might receive. You will receive blessing from the Lord. Start to reflect on these attributes in your life. He is very conclusive and convincing, not just in the wording, but ultimately in the order. We cannot avoid demonstrating these attributes in our lives. These are not opportunities that we can ignore or overlook or discard. And I think about our senior minister, Pastor Colin. He's just taken us through the Sermon on the Mount as a series, buried right in the middle of it. Matthew 5, verse 8, Jesus declared, and I quote, Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Stop the clock. Pause. Right where you are, do you want to see God? Before you say yes, think about what that would look like in your own life. You came face to face with God. Would you be able to stand? What would you say? with the glory and the splendor and the majesty and the power just totally overcome and overrun you? And yet the word is so clear. We have access and availability to having an audience with the king. I doubt there's a person in this room that has even seen the queen, let alone sat down and had tea with her. And yet here we are, having the possibility of an audience of one with the king. One king, one ruler, one creator, one holy, one sovereign God. Are you willing to take that? What would it look like for you? You know, when I reflected on the four attributes needed, the only person that can fulfill them is Jesus. David himself fell short, murdered, committed adultery, Pride in his heart. He must have felt hypocritical in writing these words because he himself couldn't fulfill it. But that did not stop him from communicating what was necessary, which leads me to the next point, that even if we don't possess in the natural today the ability to achieve it in and of ourselves, we can be prepared to reach for what is necessary in our lives. Because as we reach for what is necessary, we will achieve it. Or do we just want to relegate our lives to just merely having an awareness of what is necessary to have an encounter with the king at this level, but not actually take any steps to engage with that and to actually enjoy that? No. God has more. And now David shifts his focus. Focus. And he makes what I consider to be a pretty ill-advised comparison between a generation of God chasers and Jacob. Like, why do I say ill-advised? Well, how many of us would put our hands up and say, yeah, Jacob, I'd use him as an example? Probably not. 
He doesn't exactly cover himself in glory. I wouldn't say integrity is at the forefront of his heart and life. He was cunning, he was a liar, devious, deceitful. Hardly the attributes needed for a good comparison with a generation of sold out, God-seeking believers. And yet it starts to make sense. Jacob had encountered God and was unwilling to leave the presence of God without getting his blessing. When were you last like that? When were you last at the point in your life where you're on your knees, crying, sobbing before the King of glory, refusing to leave his presence until you get the breakthrough that you need in your life? And what are you prepared to do to get it? A few flimsy minutes between brushing your teeth and sinking, sinking your second cup of coffee so you can be sociable on Monday morning. No, 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 no. It's going to require a lot more than that. Not more effort, more surrender. Not more striving, more submission. And these are elements that we're uncomfortable with because it requires us to relinquish control. And we like control. All of us do. Whether we admit it or not is absolutely irrelevant. I'm telling you it as a fact. We like control because if you have a measure of control, then you get to define or dictate the outcome, which removes fear. And do you know what fear is? Fear is, first of all, a liar. Amen. But more than that, fear is actually you having faith in something or someone that can negatively impact your life. What lies? From the pit of hell. The Bible declares what? Perfect love casts out what? All fear. Not certain fears. Fears that might apply to men and not women or vice versa. No, all fear. So I ask the question again, what are you prepared to do to get your breakthrough? Number three, he is sovereign. David drives this point home. And I think this is absolutely crucial for us today. We must continually lift up our head and accept the entrance of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords into our lives. Nothing and no one is greater in our lives than him. Not your intellect, not your information, not what you know about you, no. He is sovereign, he is Lord, he rules, he reigns, and he has your entire world in the palm of his hand. And there is no better place for your world to be than in the palm of his hand, amen. Which means that we must acknowledge him as sovereign. We have no role, no remit in our own lives, which means that we have to abandon the lie and the concept that the world keeps dictating to us that we actually have a say about in our lives. You are not your ruling authority in your life. Some breaking news for one or two of us this afternoon. You are not the ruling authority in your life. God is. Control is always linked to fear. No less than five times he is called the king of glory. Talk about emphasize a point. David is reminding us that the Lord and the Lord alone is truly sovereign. We all know that song, be high and lift it up. Amen. And in that, in that worship song, we are declaring the praise and the worship to God. And that's what David was encouraging and instructing the entire city to give not just a genuine welcome, but a heartfelt, all-consuming welcome to the King of glory. Verses 7 and verse 9 are almost identical in words. O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. I think David's probably exercising some spiritual gift that he's got there and stipulating that Jesus is once again going to pass through those gates. He had already done it on Palm Sunday, going through with the donkey. All the public standing there, pageantry, parading, acknowledging who he was. Now David was not offering some flimsy, poorly constructed prediction for us. He was giving us deep spiritual truths and realities about the sovereignty of God. He was demonstrating that he himself was ultimately the risen king. So will you adopt today the correct heart posture that David deployed in living in wonder and awe at the Lord in your life? Will you go against the grain of today's society that even rejects God out of hand, much less acknowledges his lordship and his sovereignty? Will you allow his goodness and his greatness to permeate 
and radiate in every single area of your life. Ultimately, that will happen. He will return glorious and victorious to this earth. He and he alone is the king of glory. And he is here and he is present in your life today. So I want to remind you right where you are that the wonderful, personal, intimate relationship that you enjoy with the creator of heaven and earth is yours. And it's your responsibility. The health, the strength, the veracity of that relationship sits with you and you alone. You know why? You on your absolute best day, when you want to spend time with him, he still wants to spend time with you more. On your best day, when there's no distractions, there's no social media, there's nothing on TV, cell phones not ringing, Xbox is packed down, just you and him. In that moment, he still wants to spend more time with you than you do with him. That reality is glorious in my mind. The Bible declares in James 4 verse 8 that if you draw close to him, the onus and responsibility sits with us. Promise, he will draw close to you. Withhold nothing from him in your life. Give him everything. Do not think for a moment that the sky-high standard that David stipulates should cause you to distance yourself from God. That's actually an invitation to draw closer to him, to inquire of him, to download what is on his heart for your life. Now, the ascending the hill thing is about maintaining that standard of purity and integrity, which means that we don't recoil, we don't retreat back into worldly thinking. So right where you are, why don't you welcome the King of Kings back into your heart? Why don't you be wholehearted in that welcome, the way David wanted that city to be. Learn to dwell and abide in his presence. I believe this psalm is deeply prophetic. It reflects the future of the church. It provides us with the framework and the reminder of the majesty and the glory of God that he will establish his kingdom, solidify his throne in this very place. And this new season is going to demand that we step into that great unknown. But we don't need to fear because he as the creator knows already what is in that great unknown. He just wants to ask, are you prepared to be courageous? Are you prepared to be bold? Are you prepared to live your faith out radically? Not from the confines and safety of your home and your small group and your cell group, but no, right there in the marketplace, on every street corner, on every highway and byway that you will proclaim, you will declare the name of Jesus at every opportunity to see his kingdom not just be established, but to see the influence and impact of the kingdom strengthened, grow, develop, maximize. Why? You have a God-given responsibility attached to that. Is there boldness in your heart, friends, for this new season? We need wisdom, discernment now more than ever because he and he alone has the capacity to breathe life into us. Through the leading of his Holy Spirit, he will enable us.